almost shifting from looking at spatial autocorrelation to uh, spatial regression. And the point that I made in conclusion was that um, the different scientific uh, disciplines have different choices for the representation or for their preferred representations of uh, relationships between observations. As the uh, conceptual understanding of spatial autocorrelation developed from the insight that uh, when we're dealing with spatial and spatiotemporal data, as well as time series data, it is fairly strictly unlikely that the observations are independent one of another. And one way of representing uh, the relationships between um, entities that do not necessarily constitute a continuous surface as they would do in, in a geostatistical approach, at which uh, variables are observed, is to, is to represent them as a graph. And if we represent them as a graph, we can look at the, at the distance in steps across the graph, given that the actual uh, process which is being, uh, which is being uh, represented uh, actually involves the inverse of, uh, of, of the uh, matrix representing the graph. In that case, the steps across the graph are very similar in their expression to the measured distance between those entities in which case using uh, a sparse or graph-based uh, representation uh, is uh, usually uh, well taken. However, it's also the case that one can uh, not unreasonably uh, look to non-geographic measures of relationships between the uh, observational entities. So one example of this would be, and, and uh, how, how many of you done, have done uh, old style macroeconomics? So sort of nobody. But at the time that uh, spatial analysis and spatial econometrics came into being, uh, one of the um, key terms was I.O., which doesn't mean industrial organization. It means input-output. And the Leontief matrix is a matrix of flows between sectors in an economy. It can be extended and was extended during the 1970s and 1980s to, uh, to uh, attempt to capture flows between the environment and the economy as well. So that you, and you can add the labor as a supply and households as a, a demand element in this. But, but input-output uh, analysis was, was well known. And one of the features which enters into input-output analysis is that you have a matrix like this, which also in the Uh, input-output setting, the technical matrix can also be represented as powers in, in that. So that when spatial econometrics, which is one of the, one of the conceptualizations of spatial regression, came into being, there was a whole series of the, the, the essentially three representations. One was the spatial representation that were interested in the way in which the behavior of one Dutch province policy steps taken in one Dutch province affect others. In, in particular, both the Netherlands and Sweden regionalized their national budgets and national accounts. And they were then interested in knowing whether government spending in one province leaked to another province. In France, it was found in 1969 that 75% of investment in the gas industry in southwestern France leaked back to Paris in the first steps, so the first transaction led the money to go back to Paris. Paris was saying, we're being really nice to you, giving you lots of cash, and it all leaked back. So this, this, this spillover idea 
has been present for, for a very long time. Uh, however, it's now sort of disappeared so that people don't see that the, this, this sort of spillover or transactions between sectors, uh, that the, the, they were important. So one model was to try to capture spillovers uh, resulting from government spending to other provinces than the provinces in which the spending was, or to which the spending was, was directed. So that was one, and that was then called spatial econometrics. Then there was input-output, which was looking at uh, transactions between sectors. And the third model, sort of classical uh, uh, econometrics, uh, was a multi-equation model where you might have one equation for supply and another equation for demand. And the, the supply would enter into the demand equation, the demand would enter into the supply equation, which meant that you had a matrix of errors, and the matrix of errors also had spillovers between the equations. Uh, because a variable on the left-hand side was on the on the left-hand side was on the right-hand side in one equation and the other way around in a, in a second or third or fourth equation. So that in, in uh, macroeconomic modeling uh, in, in, a, in a structural equation framework, you got exactly the same, the same, the same structure. But in a Leontiev, Leontiev matrix, obviously sectors can interact, but there would be many sectors where the interactions are very, very sparse or zero. So the, 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 there aren't significant direct interactions between those sectors, but because of the powering of the matrix here, you do get the whole graph of links between sectors, so that you might say that the, 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 the links between one very detailed sector and another very detailed sector somewhere else on the table of, of, of uh, sectoral transactions or intersectoral transactions, they don't interact one with another, but they do through intermediaries. So the, 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 the production of, say, coke is not directly related to, uh, to uh, the production of milk. But indirectly, you'll find that there are, there are links as you power up the, 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 the links across the matrix. So the, there's, been a, there's, there's, there's been quite a lot of... Uh, um, background, history, to the way in which these um, uh, interactions may occur. And in the uh, Leontiev matrix, the input-output se setting, and in the uh, structural model setting, the interactions were not between observations as such, but they were s structurally embedded in, 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 in the models themselves. Now, in treatments in in, uh, say, in ecology, which is one of the areas which prefers to use inverse distance, so that uh, the weight between I and J is inversely proportional to the, to the, to the physical distance be be between them, uh, it's very pervasive. Uh, however, when you are dealing with a dense uh, matrix representing the weights, uh, you can engender uh, problems relate not numerical problems uh, downstream because that matrix is dense and you then need to operate on a, a uh, and a dense n by n matrix and as n increases the more problematic this becomes uh, before space ma sparse matrices uh, or sparse matrix um, techniques became uh, widely available um, we're probably then looking at the end of the 1980s, when when there was there were some routines which were becoming available. The ones which are, are currently uh, well provided for in R are in the matrix with a big M package, and they use the same underlying code as is used in in MATLAB, which is so so that the the sparse matrices are behaving in more or less the same way. There are some settings in which sparse matrices play in. Uh, strongly, there are other settings in which sparse matrices are, are not so much use, but but uh, uh, this is is it's something to be aware of when you when you see textbooks in spatial regression, then they simply represent the weights matrix as a matrix, but it doesn't have to be dense, and if it's not dense, then there will be a whole range of uh, approaches which can be used to 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 um, enable the rapid calculation even of moderately sized data set, 25,000 observations. It isn't a problem to fit a spatial regression to, 
25,000 observations. But if you try to do it using dense matrices, you do get problems for obvious reasons, because 25,000 by 25,000 by 8 is quite a large matrix. And if you're, say, trying to extract the eigenvalues from a matrix like that, then you're involved in several copies of that as well. Uh, so you max out your, 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 your RAM. But if you treat them as sparse matrices, then there's, the, the, there isn't a problem. It, 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 even on a, on a laptop, you're running a, a, a spatial regression involving 25,000 observations in, 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 in a second or so. Um, but if you want to go dense, then you need a lot of RAM and it's going to take, take more time. So the, the, the choices which are made by the disciplines, which they assume are um, harmless, have pragmatic consequences. They may not have theoretical consequences. It may be that it's completely reasonable to look at the distances and say this is, this is, this is, this represents uh, the uh, what we know about how these how these uh, how these entities influence one another. But it may not be necessary because you can also represent the same thing by steps on a graph. So that was that was where we were when we were, when we rounded up uh, yesterday. Uh, just to finish up the the uh, the, the script for, for with regard to spatial autocorrelation, uh, the, as I make I will make a couple of points about the the ease with which one can tr transfer the uh, the uh, the um, uh, neighbor objects to. Uh, uh, to ob to neighbor objects, which alternative, alternatively can be, for, exa for example, used by in Bayes' X, in Inler, and in other similar forms. Uh, approaches in a forthcoming, or as, as yet still on GitHub package for, uh, for uh, Bayesian spatial regression um, using uh, JAGS and, and STAN have not got beyond dense matrices, and when you're using dense matrices, then you're in in, in a harder place. Um, but uh, both both Bayes-X and and um, Inla can can handle sparse matrices, and indeed, the whole point of Inla is to build on on uh, the sparseness of uh, a, a Gaussian Markov random field. A Markov random field can easily be re represented by a graph. A Gaussian random field is, is by definition continuous, but the, the uh, contribution of distant neighbors to each other is seen as being so close to zero that they can be set to zero, so that you get a Gaussian Markov random field where many of the elements of an otherwise Dense matrix becomes zero, so the matrix goes sparse. Uh, so that so that uh, in lab or, or the the underlying um, uh, Gaussian Markov random field library, which is what does the computing for for for, for Inla, uh, is is uh, is is using the same graph like uh, characteristic of of uh, uh, spatial relationships. Uh, the analysis originally in the uh, Cressy Reed and and uh, the that's the the eighty five paper the eighty nine paper for 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 north uh, north the North Carolina SIDS data set uh, was analysed uh, based on um, Freeman Tukey uh, transformed rates so that we, it didn't just take the straight rate the number of SIDS cases divided by the number of births. Um, but this is a, a freeman tukey transformation of, of, of the rate. It's not the way one would do it now, because now one would use a, a, a spatial a Poisson regression um, using the count data offset by the log of the... Of the so you'd, you'd, you'd regress on this count um, but offset by the log of the number of cases, so that if you've got a log length, and it's, so it's the log of uh, the number of cases minus the log of the number of persons at risk or the number of births, which is the same as the rate. So it's log minus 
log is if you anti log then then you're back at, at the rate. So it's this divided by this. Uh, these are the, 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 the variables of interest. Um, if we plot the relationship between SIDS, the 74, 70, uh, 78 uh, data set, there was a relationship with non-white non births, but as I suggested, this is probably a proxy for deprivation across the counties in, 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 in North Carolina. Um, so, and these, these are then the freeman tukey uh, transformed uh, uh, variables. And we find that the, the, there, is, or there appears to be uh, autocorrelation present in the, in the SIDS rate. Uh, and the same value would be found, uh, or a similar value would be found, as this was uh, in, in the regression residuals. But if we use weights, we get a a stronger relationship. So here, here we're just saying each county counts equally. And uh, if we use the weights, then we're finding actually that there's a stronger neighbor relationship because we're now taking more or paying more attention to counties with larger populations. And counties with smaller populations uh, are, are, are less important. Weights are something of a problem across uh, different, um, again, different disciplines. Some disciplines would say, well, if you're not weighting the cases, then, then you're really, this, this is really totally unacceptable. Uh, in other cases, particularly in economics, where there is, uh, the, there is, or there are ongoing discussions about the use of case weights, uh, some economists would argue that in certain cases it makes a lot of sense. Uh, in other cases, they would claim that it doesn't. Well, or it doesn't make it, others would claim that it never makes any sense because uh, econometricians are, are, in principle, only interested in the fit to uh, to the 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 the, um, the coefficient values. That so they're only interested in the coefficient values, and in that case, it 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 shouldn't make make, make a difference. It does sometimes, but but uh, they they say, okay, these are the observations we have. They may have different weightings in. In, in 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 general. So here we've we've used weights. Here we've uh, looked at the situation where we do not use weights, uh, but we do use a covariate, and the spatial autocorrelation has largely disappeared. Uh, but we get something back. There is that there isn't a strong spatial signal in the residuals, but there is something of a spatial signal in the residuals when we use both the covariates and and uh, and uh, case weights, so that there appears to be something going on there, uh, which we might like to explore in in a re regression setting. The regression settings were uh, developed uh, by uh, Cliff and Ord, Ord uh, 1975, Cliff and Ord 73, uh, the second edition of their books, but which is then spatial autocorrelation was the book in 73 in the, the second edition in 81, which was called Spatial Processes, and which large parallels uh, Brian Ripley's uh, discussion also in, in 81. Uh, the the basic, basic frameworks for, for spatial regression were present, so that when, by the time we get to Cressy in, in, in the book, uh, first published uh, 10 years later, then there already is a, a setting. Um, One of the considerations which you may like to uh, bear in mind is that in the 1960s, it was usual for journal art articles to be that to be a footnote saying that uh, please uh, write to the authors if you want a copy of the code. Uh, and almost all of the papers which were written during the 60s and early 70s were based on code usually written by the authors themselves. Uh, in a compiled language, either Algol or Fortran 4. Some of it in Fortran 66, and then later on, by the time you get to uh, to the 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 the, the um, early 80s, then it's Fortran 77 which is being used, or a Fortran dialect from one of the uh, one of the um, um, 
mainframe or uh, or microcomputer, or, sorry, sorry, mini computer produced so that the digital's uh, Fortran had its own dialect. Uh, the Fortran that, that I was using was either um, uh, IBM based, um, where there were some other libraries available, uh, or uh, Nosh Data, which had an excellent Fortran compiler, which was why Nosh Data was was uh, chosen as the as the provider of of uh, mini computers for CERN in 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 the in in the the late seventies and early eighties. So that uh, so Norway didn't only have a presence in terms of the similar language, but also of a of a leading manufacturer of of uh, mini computers. Because nowadays we sort of expect everything to be made in China, but but thirty years ago it was it wasn't like that. Um, Noshkrata missed one boat, which was that they didn't go with with Unix early. Uh, uh, digital did go with Unix, uh, but then both of them got mixed up with the kinds of processes that they wanted to use. That Noshkrata was designing its own processes. Uh, digital also designed its own processes, some of which some of which were excellent and and haven't been haven't been bettered. But then you got Intel moving in, and um, it was sort of end of game <laughs> for most of the other uh, providers of of, of uh, uh, compute um, power. Up until about 1972, three, four, then. Many of these, uh, many of these, um, in a way, it's quite interesting the way that the 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 industry has moved from being uh, open source. Because the word, I mean, you had to send printouts of the code in the post. That was the way that code was shared. Uh, but academics weren't weren't troubled by it. But as the uh, versions of Fortran diverged on mini computers, then it it was it was easy to punch in and run programs which had been written in the same dialect, say of Fortran, but it was not easy to switch dialects because the the so some of them, for instance, uh, in using do loops, which are a, a typical construct in in Fortran. Uh, many of the dialects introduced in a do and a do, so they would have, so you would you would construct the code. You say do, and end do, without necessarily using a, a label, but otherwise you would have to in standard Fortran sixty six seventy seven Fortran four sixty six seventy seven. You'd have to say do to which statement label. So where was the end of the loop? Was it a statement label? Things like that. So that that. Uh, in the 60s, if you got your big parcel of printout and were happily typing it in, it would usually run. As time went on, less happened that way. As time went on, many of the functions which were used, uh, say for linear algebra, uh, they were provided by the uh, manufacturer of the computer you were using. So you built against that library and they differed from system to system. So you get a you got a, a pulverization of the ability of academics to share code. Uh, you could still do it, but it was it was clunkier. One step the other way was uh, in applied statistics, which is part of the the uh, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. They published an algorithms uh, appendix, and in each issue of the journal, there would be a printed copy of the code. Uh, for uh, for for so, the, so these were the, these were the applied statistics algorithms library, but again you had to type them in. You then got communities build, you know, coming through. Um, once the internet had started rolling, and then we're looking at towards the the, the late nineteen eighties, then it was possible to download this code. Uh, the applied statistics code was subject to a, a slightly restrictive license. Uh, other code was available from TOMS, which is a journal of the of the International uh, in Electrical Engineers or Electrical and Electronic Engineers, or IEEE, 
uh, Tom's was the was the uh, was the transactions on mathematical software, and there there were there were quite a lot of, of as this is this was then under an ACM license and. The first uh, packages that Albrecht Gephardt parted, uh, ported to R in S Plus, Insightful, who were the company selling S Plus, they paid the license fees to ACM to be able to use the TriPack and the Akima libraries. Uh, but when it reached R, the libraries were obviously readable. It's just that there was a license condition saying that, that you, you had to. You had to be careful how you used them, uh, and so th the ecology then so it started getting harder. Then it started getting easier again about uh, six, seven, eight years ago. As you may remember, that there was a, 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 a um, top boss in in um, Microsoft called uh, Steve Ballmer. Uh, and he said that open source is only for brain dead people. They're people who don't like money. This was at the same time that the Apache was appearing, and uh, at, the, at the time, at the at that time, almost all DNS lookups were run on open source software in the whole internet. That's where you look up the name server to find. So you've got a, a name you want to go to, but you need an IP number. So you go to the DNS server to find out which IP number and which route I should take to get there. That was all open source. Email was all open source. Apache was open source. But uh, Microsoft was totally negative. Uh, and, and it's only recently that Microsoft has, has been, been appearing as, at big Microsoft meetings with, uh, with Microsoft Loves Linux. And about half of the instances which are run up on Azure are Linux rather than Windows. So the, 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 there has been a major change in the way that these, these kinds of things happened. But the, the ability that we have to use underlying libraries is, 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 uh, uh, is an important element of the way in which we build things up. So that the availability first of BLAS and LAPAC which are public domain, originally US uh, government funded linear algebra libraries, which are, uh, are sort of standard, standard, standard. If you don't use those, you, you, you need to explain why in, in, in writing your software. R is based on, on, on BLAS and LAPAC, but with contributions from R back to BLAS and LAPAC to, to LAPAC to to keep them keep them running and then we get to to projects like uh, like the the development of code for for sparse matrices so this is the the beginning of the 2000s the late 1990s the beginning of the 2000s there are several internally in r there's one called spam uh, sparse matrices which is excellent and is used by the fields package for for geostatistics and and in other areas uh, in some ways, it's better than the one which is used in the matrix package and by by uh, by um, by MATLAB. Uh, there was another uh, written by Roger Conker, who's a, as a, a, a quantile regression econometrician. So he wrote his own because he needed it for his own own purposes. So that there are a number of, of of different ways of handling sparse matrices. The relationship between spatial regression and sparse matrices is is completely uh, so that if we don't have sparse matrices, it makes it very difficult to to run uh, spatial regressions. Okay, spatial regression background, some of which I've I've just covered, so that the 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 grasping the way in which things uh, the way in which things um, uh, relate one to another. Quite a lot of this goes through 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 sparse matrices. Now, uh, one of the uh, one of the key differences uh, which uh, exist between the different approaches has been that some of the so I'll come on to that in a moment. A, a little bit more background first is if we have here uh, 
this is a, a John Tukey description of what we're doing when we're modeling. As we've got data, we think we know something about the way that the data, this data is generated, and we've got a residual. So the Tukey divides the model into a, a smooth and a rough. Now, what happens in the spatial case is that we insert here a, and we then move some of the variability from the rough into the spatial smooth. Now, when we've been looking at tests for spatial autocorrelation, what we've been doing is trying to find patterning in the rough, in the residuals. And if we can then move some of that patterning into a spatial smooth, we should improve the fit of the model. But it may also be that when we were fitting... Oops. Don't touch smart boards. Uh, when, when we were fitting the smooth, it may well be that... Uh, the methods we were using, which assumed that the observations were independent one of another, were not appropriate. So that one of the reasons to use spatial regression is to get a better grasp on what's going on and to change the, uh, change the ratio between the variance of the residual and the variance of the input data as what one's trying to do is to absorb as much as possible of the variability in the input data in the model and leave as little as possible in the residual. And so if we can find spatial patterning in the residual and move it into the model, then we're good. The other way of expressing the need for using spatial regression methods is saying that if we fit the model ignoring the spatial smooth and there is spatial patterning in the residual, then the methods which we've chosen to use to uh, infer from the coefficients on the smooth will probably be uh, uh, inappropriate. As in particular, uh, one would find that the, the estimated uh, variance of the coefficients is too narrow. In, uh, there's a paper by, 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 um, by Smith discussing this in very, it's about 40 pages, a lot of detail. There are situations in which there is no problem. This is when there is no spatial patterning in this one. Sorry, there, there's spatial patterning in the data, but there's no problem, misspecification problem in our design of the smooth so that the smooth is taking out all of the spatial patterning in the data, leaving no, pattern, no, re, no residual autocorrelation here, in which case we're okay. But we don't necessarily know that in advance, and we may be in a situation where, even though our best guess at the variables we should include in the model and their functional form is being used, we may still not be in full cognizance of the way in which the data generating process actually works. So we may have a missing variable problem, we may have, uh, we may have uh, other sources of misspecification. In that situation, we would probably need to move towards uh, some, some form of, of spatial regression. Now one form of spatial regression, which can be used, uh, spatial smooth, is to say that uh, that uh, we can use a geostatistical approach to this, so that we could uh, use a variogram approach to the to the uh, to the residuals, model uh, the spatial process in the residuals, and add that back into the into the, into the model. Uh, this is available in uh, an, a, a fairly large range of linear mixed model and uh, generalized linear mixed model approaches by using a, uh, a geostatistical model. S say that you would say that you're using a Matan, 
uh, Matern model or uh, an exponential model or a Gaussian model or some other model in the variogram. So you use the model of variogram and capture the, uh, the, the patterning in the residuals in, in that way. And that, that works pretty well and it's used quite widely. Um, uh, also in, for instance, there's a package called, which is probably one of the more uh, sophisticated ones at the moment, uh, GLMM uh, uh, TMB, is Templated Model Builder. Has anybody met a Templated Model Builder? And you can note it, as, but, but Templated Model Builder is a very nice approach. But the way that they've handled spatial regression for the time being is to approach it through, uh, through, um, uh, th through a ge geostatistical approach rather than a, a graph-based uh, Markov random field uh, approach. Uh, so that in quite a number of the R packages, including NL NLME, uh, which is the Pinero Bates 2000 book uh, that uses a geostatistical approach to uh, to, to modeling the uh, the spatial smooth which we want to inject into the model in many cases this is this is quite okay and in uh, in a, a largish literature this would be the standard approach uh, there's a uh, there's an R journal paper on uh, uh, GLMM T TMB, which came out uh, two, two years ago, or may maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and the kinds of models which you see there are models, uh, also including some of the models available in Bayes X and, and uh, elsewhere. Um, is the, this, the, the paper on, on GLMM uh, TMB. Uh, considers the the difficult case of uh, uh, zero inflated uh, uh, um, observations, uh, which are quite often found for relatively uh, uh, sparsely occurring um, mammals. In the cases they're usually using, it's either seabirds or or, or, or mammals, where the vast majority of of the map has nothing. Uh, where you also have an observation problem, uh, say you're looking for seabirds and you're sailing uh, uh, research cruises, then obviously you're not going to find them where the boat, boat didn't go. So and that kind of thing. So that the, you can deal with a relatively complicated uh, mo modeling, modeling framework. However, we're going to go for, for the graph-based approaches so that we're not going to go directly to uh, uh, um, linear mix models or generalized linear mix models. We're going to go along the uh, the, the um, uh, Cliff and Ord, Ripley, Cressy, uh, Markov random field uh, approach. And we occasionally will flip to the Bessag approach. So the, the, there, are, there are two strands, one of which is much stronger in epidemiology, which is the, the Julian Bessag approach, and the other approaches are, are more often seen uh, elsewhere, uh, in the social sciences in particular, but, but also uh, in a, uh, probably, probably it would be reasonable to say that the, say, the, the same would apply to ecology. So, okay, uh, background information uh, in our functions to fit many of these models are in packages which I'm which I maintain originally everything was in spdep uh, however spdep ended up having a lot of uh, dependencies as other packages using spdep but after surveying those early this year it turned out that the vast majority just use the facilities of spdep for constructing um, uh, spatial weights so they don't actually need to do the modeling as there is, so that now SPDEP is going to uh, uh, provide functions for creating weights and tests for spatial autocorrelation, but not the uh, modeling, uh, modeling um, uh, functions. And the modeling functions are now both in SPDEP and in spatial reg, but spatial reg is where they are going to, uh, going to be maintained and they will be removed from SPDEP uh, during the course of the next year. So there are a couple of, of uh, implementations of uh, the 
the standard model. This this representation is 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 uh, somewhat more uh, more uh, complex, and the representation here would be. Um, Okay, so, so far so good. The, that's it's it's a it's a it's a basic linear model. However, this is the problem. That's where the 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 spatial process is. He, here, this is just a regular linear model. Here, this is where the spatial process is. where this one is uh, almost elastic error, but we've got this spatial process going on here. And if we then say, uh, then uh, attempt to e express what's going on here. We could, we could, we could say that um, uh, sorry, it's the wrong way around. So what I need to do here is to uh, to. Um, Go through all the steps. That's well, that's okay, I think. And then you get the So this is where the, this this uh, this inverse process is coming in. So that that's what what's what's driving the process to get so that when we're shifting from a process which is independent in the observations to a process which is dependent in the observations, and this is the this is the direct operator. So that if we wanted to look at the the the, the representation, we would no longer have have this one. But what we get out is uh, so it's then n. Uh, zero mean, and then we've got um, um, the transpose of W minus rho W inverse. And this is then the simultaneous autoregressive process that the, the, the the, that we're looking at the 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 product of the transpose of this matrix inverse. So this is this is a simultaneous autoregressive model. The alternative used in other disciplines is a conditional autoregressive model, which says that we're looking at uh, the value at uh, the value of the residual at i conditional on the value at all the other not i places. In this case, in the simultaneous case, it does everything, all of them, all at the same time, simultaneously, and conditional uh, looks at i in, in, in the conditional context of the, all the others without i, and then change, changes i and looks at those. So, it, so that this, this, this is the, the process for a SAR model. That's maybe... This was the SAR model. And then the CAR model will be uh, N. without the product. So that for the car model, W has to be strictly symmetric. For the SAR model, W doesn't have to be symmetric because 
the matrix and it's transposed and multiplied together. And that matrix is going to be symmetric. So that product is going to be symmetric. In general, it's probably a good idea to have a symmetric W anyway. It makes life easier, but you don't have to in a SAR model. In a CAR model, you do have to. Uh, there's a, uh, a uh, nice textbook in uh, spatial data for public health by, by Gottway and Waller, Waller and Gottway. And they, they suggested that it would be nice to be able to repro uh, reproduce the results that they had in their book. So that the, the, this, this function, uh, SP Auto LM, was written shortly after their book came out in, in 2004. Uh, and provides then for doing the same kind of thing with SAR, with CAR, and with and without weights, because that was what they did in, in, in their book. The data that they use in the book are the data we use uh, in the uh, ASTAR books. So we use their data sets in our books to show that you could, re you could use these functions to reproduce the results they were getting. Uh, they didn't, in the end, publish their code, but they said it would be very useful if somebody had produced our code, which would allow them to do this, uh, to, uh, to allow them to do this, so that the SP Auto LM allows one to fit uh, an auto Gaussian uh, 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 spatial regression, either in the SAR family or in the CAR family. Probably family is the wrong name for the argument, but it, that was what it was in the beginning, so that's the way it stayed. Uh, it can only fit continuous responses, and here we're fitting fitting uh, the model including the weights and the uh, covariate. And if we take a summary then of the fitted model object, uh, we, get, we get a result, some, some, something like this. What we've, what we've then now found is uh, this is the, the intercept, this is the coefficient for, uh, for the uh, non-white births. Uh, and the spatial coefficient is uh, it would be difficult to say that this is making a, a, a major contribution to the uh, to the um, to, to the um, uh, to the explanation of the of the SIDS rate. It, it's not it, it's not obvious that this is this is this is this is the the, 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 the case. Uh, there's a this is a likelihood ratio test. If one wanted to carry out a uh, a, um, a, a T test or Z test in this case because this is maximum likelihood. Uh, then we here you've got the the estimate of the spatial coefficient and here you've got the estimate of its standard error. So you could see that so so, so the value of the coefficient divided by by the standard error is going to give you a, a Z value, but one and a half. It'd be difficult to say that there's a big spatial thing going on there, but. The, but the, maybe there is. And if you remember from the Moran's test, that was also sort of borderline. You, you wouldn't probably consider that as being, being important. Um, so including weights and the covariates, the, this, is, this is the way things are going on. How is the estimation taking place? In this case, the estimation is taking place. It's a small data set, 100 observations. In the, 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 the early 90, late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, I've mentioned before the appearance of the uh, of the SPATSTAT, uh, 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 so not of, uh, of uh, uh, SS, the S plus S plus uh, spatial stats module in '96, and they were also using the same same approaches here. The approach uh, which is used is the approach going back to uh, to Ord's uh, Journal of the American. Statistical Association paper from 1975, which is to take the eigenvalues of the W matrix. In 1975, the eigenvalues of a 100 by 100 matrix was taxing for most mainframes. Uh, but now we're a long time after that, so it's, it's just it's, uh, the eigenvalues of a, of, a, of a symmetric matrix are found uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so we 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 don't have a we don't have a, a technical problem with doing, but that's that's what's happening by 
by by default. I need to correct this. So that's what's hap happening by, by default. We're choosing to use the eigenvalues for for calculating the the um, the um, Jacobian. The Jacobian, which is an essential part of the of the uh, um, uh, log likelihood function, so we're fitting by maximum likelihood, uh, represents the cost borne by shifting from, uh, so shifting between independent and dependent uh, observations. And that cost, which is is it, it's it's the log of the determinant of uh, the matrix uh, identity minus rho w, as rho approaches its domain bound. That log becomes a very large negative number. So that we're trying to fit maximum likelihood, but the cost of moving from or moving between dependent and independent. Uh, observations becomes very very large as as if you said the uh, the spatial autocorrelation in residual approaches its maximum feasible value the maximum feasible value would be that you could predict all the values on the graph from one observation because because the spatial process is so dominant it's so strong at which at which point the weight being placed on the on, on, on the maximum likelihood function. The maximum likelihood function is trying to fit the coefficients on the x's to, to, to get to a maximum. It's trying to find the optimum, optimum. So at least squares is maximum likelihood. So at least squares is giving you the best possible uh, values of the coefficients to minimize the residual sum of squares. But in this case, we're not just getting the best values of the coefficients to minimize the residual sum of squares. So the maximum likelihood would be up, upside down. So maximizing the, the log likelihood function. We're now also faced with a, with a, with a, with a penalty caused by the uh, spatial, auto, auto, uh, spatial autocorrelation in the residuals of the model, which is so that the we're saying, yeah, the, the X's are giving us a really good fit, so they're pushing in that direction, and the more spatial autocorrelation there is, the more you're being pulled away from that. In the positive spatial autocorrelation case, the, the negative spatial autocorrelation case is very poorly studied, so that we don't know very much about the negative spatial autocorrelation case. But in positive spatial autocorrelation, then, then, then you're being pulled... Uh, I'd hazard a guess that, that if you were facing very strong negative uh, spatial autocorrelation, which given the usual design of weights is most unlikely, uh, you would be in what was originally known or known in the 60s as in the antithetic sampling situation, which means that you can get um, a better sample with fewer observations you want to have a sample where the samples are independent one of another. That's okay. So that would be the independent case. If you increase, so you've got positive, positive dependence between the observations, you're losing effective degrees of freedom. But if you've got negative spatial autocorrelation or negative dependence between samples, you increase the effective uh, so it was a trick which was used in the 1960s when computers were small. When you wanted to have a, a, a smaller sample than uh, the textbook size, then you made the uh, samples uh, negatively correlated. It was called anti antithetic uh, sampling. Um, I haven't seen it used this century, but it may be, it may be, maybe somebody uses it somewhere. Uh, it wasn't used in spatial things. It was it was in in uh, theoretical work on on uh, Monte Carlo uh, sampling, and I met it in a translation into Polish of a Russian maths book, as we were trying to find ways of doing sampling. As sampling from spatial processes in the nineteen seventies took took a long time, and this was the night shift. So if you could try and make it a bit quicker than 
than you did. So that, that, that was where that came from. But we don't know very much about what happens when, uh, when, uh, when the, the, the spatial process is, is, is negative, which means that places which are cl close to each other on the graph are very unlike one another. Someone has called this the, the chessboard problem. However, most people designing weights on a chessboard say that, well, actually, if you use the queen movement on the chessboard, then a regular chessboard pattern with zeros and ones ends up with no spatial autocorrelation because each, uh, each uh, uh, square not on the edge of the chessboard has uh, precisely four white neighbors, four zero neighbors, four uh, one neighbors, so that <laughs> there isn't any <laughs> autocorrelation. If you, on the other hand, use the rook definition, uh, then then there's uh, uh, absolute negative autocorrelation, because your neighbors, are, your your uh, up, down, left, right neighbors are always the other color to you. So uh, SP Auto LM is fitting uh, as, as, uh, a, um, a simultaneous autoregressive model. It's using these these weights here, which were binary. It's using the data. It's using the case weights here, and this was this this is the this is the formula. And it's being fit using uh, eigenvalues to 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 um, uh, to calculate the uh, the the Jacobian. The Jacobian is is very it, it, it's very like the, the the process here. So the Jacobian is expressed as the this, this so the and it's then the the uh, the log of the of the determinant of that that matrix. Now this is one of the places where you start being hit by dense. W, as if W is dense, then you've got a lot more work to do to find out the determinant. And Ord's result from 1975, long time ago. Nobody else than me was born before then, right? But the, this is this is it's an it's a nice result, uh, which is that this is equal to the sum of the um, of of i um, and I think that's right. I'm, I'm trying to remember, but my my, my head is not not completely present. Um, where are the are, are the eigenvalues? Of, so that you can com compute them once, and then when you're uh, maximizing the uh, the uh, log likelihood function, then then you're just involved in in a, a series of uh, simple uh, sums. So uh, there's a, a scalar multiplication uh, for so n scalar multiplication of the sum. Uh, you can. Uh, do a product and then the log of the product, but doing the log inside and the uh, and the uh, and the sum over the over the logs is 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 numerically more stable. So one of the the the, the, so the, the and this it, it runs it, it runs fast as you do do the solve the eigen problem once and and you're done. Um, if n is larger, then you can use a sparse Koleski. Uh, and that that's then so that uh, there's there's a there's a there's an additional argument which isn't uh, shown here, uh, which is method equals and if method is eigen, then it uses the odd seventy five approach. If method is m matrix big M, then it uses an approach by pre computing the uh, sparse Koleski de decomposition of uh, a function of the W matrix, where you just plug in the row for each time you go through the uh, through the optimization routine for finding the uh, fi finding the optimum of the of the log likelihood function, and it it just it just it just works. There, there are uh, the implementation of 
finding the results for the Jacobian um, includes a dozen or so different different methods. Um, so using sparse Koleski, you can use sparse LU if your W is is uh, is uh, asymmetric. If you're since the uh, for only for, only in the last ten years have we got traction on handling the eigenvalues of an asymmetric W, uh, because uh, up until relatively recently the C language did not have a, a, a good portable standard representation of of complex numbers. So and it, it got resolved, but but now we can do that too. Um, and there's a paper by myself and uh, Jan Hauke and uh, Thomas Kosowski from 2013, which goes into painful detail about how to calculate Jacobians. Um, again, Jim Lesage, to, to, to spread an anecdote, he said, how many people in the world do you think are interested in this? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't think it's very many. He said, as far as I know, it's five. <laughs> and some of them are quite old. <laughs> The problem is that it all stands on this, so that, so that a typical reply to me to a query from a user of, of spatial reg or, or from SPDEP was that I've got a large data set, I've got 700 observations, and it's taking a long time to fit the regression. It says, did you look at the method argument? What method argument? Did you look at the help page for the function? Why? I said, it does help to look at the help page. That's why they're called help pages. <laughs> ah, there's a, there's a methods argument. I set it to matrix with a big M. Okay. And then you don't hear from them again. Because it just runs. So that when I was saying, it's okay, 25,000 is not a problem, but you need to choose the method as the default method is the eigenvalue, which is going to need once to extract the uh, the uh, the eigenvalues for the w for the dense w matrix, but for larger data, then there there, there are lots of ways. Uh, uh, Lesage and Pace in in their book on spatial econometrics have a whole list of different ways of doing it. The, you can use Chebyshev approximations. You can use you can even use Monte Carlo simulation to generate the, 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 the Jacobians. One of the approaches they use for Bayesian statistics is to uh, generate a grid of values. So you generate a grid of values using sparse LU, say about 200 values, and because there are, it's, it's a fairly smooth function, the log determinant uh, in relation to rho, so you say for a grid of values of rho, what's the log determinant? And then you fit a spline, a spline function to that, so that you can then sample from the spline function uh, to find, so you've got a grid, say, of the 200 values, but you want something which is in between two of them. Um, it's, it's, it's not hard. A million observations takes a little longer, but you get there. And you can even get there with Bayesian uh, methods, so doing sampling on this sort of but still people say, I can't fit a large model. Constructing weights can be a problem. Uh, recently I've been in correspondence with somebody on RSIG Geo who wanted to model two and a half million Airbnb lets in New York and wanted to construct a dense matrix. Sorry, it, it's really hard to construct a, a dense matrix of two and a half million by two and a half million. Sparse might be okay, or a million with a sparse matrix, you're probably going to be be be, be fine, uh, but with a dense two and a half million by two and a half million, is this actually a good description of the of the process? Probably not. It's probably there's a simpler description of the of the process. One of the things which uh, one of the things which is seldom done is to extract the. Uh, implied spatially structured random effect. This is the the U in the model here. So this is this is then a map map of what the U would look like uh, in 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 this case. But here we're doing it by 
sort of grabbing the bits of the of uh, of, uh, of the of the um, object returned when we fitted the model. As here we've got the value of the spatial coefficient. The spatial coefficient, although I've been using rho to describe it here, which is the generic term, uh, one distinguishes between lambda as the coefficient in the spatial error model and uh, rho as the coefficient in uh, an alternative representation, which we'll get to before too long. Uh, the same re same values come from RSRLM. Uh, RSRLM does not have the facility for extension to CAR or uh, a spatial moving average model. And it gives exactly the same results, but it also provides, and this is a useful tip, uh, the facility for computing a Hausmann test. A Hausmann test was, or the Hausmann test, between uh, spatial error models and the equivalent linear model uh, was introduced by uh, uh, Kelly Pace and Jim Lesage in an article in 2008. There are a few implementations of it, but it's a very useful uh, uh, specification test on the model. Uh, the Hausmann test tests whether the coefficient, coefficients on the axes differ more than one would expect, given the variability in the model, between the least squares fit and the spatial error model fit. So this, this box. If they differ a lot, so more than you'd expect, given the variability in the model, your spatial error model is misspecified. There may be missing. It means that there's something unexpected going on, because. The, the spatial process in, in our model here, in this model, the spatial process is not in this. It's in this. But if the coefficients move around, the betas move around more than you would expect, given the variability in the model, it means there's something misspecified in the model. And the Hausmann test, which, which, which is then implemented as sort of extra to the summary for, for spatial error models in, in uh, uh, spatial reg, oh. uh, so that you'd, you'd ask for Hausmann is true. And in this case, it, it's, it says that it's quite unlikely that the differences are so large that they could not have occurred given the variability in the model. There is very little difference between an OLS fit and the, the other fit. This would partly be related to the strength or the, the, the weakness of the spatial process in the residual in this model. The, the model is actually quite well specified if we're including the covariate, which is a proxy for deprivation and the case weights. It's quite a well specified model so that probably there isn't a, a big spatial process there. Which is a bit of a shame for Cressy. Because if, you, if you've, you've spent a whole book chapter developing a method, and it then turns out that, that actually in this, the data set which is being used to, to expound the, the, the value of the method, it turns out that there, perhaps there isn't a spatial story anyway, then, then it's, it's a bit of a problem. But, but I mean, if you're a... If you're a, an academic statistician, you're interested in the in the method and not whether actually the application, uh, the, the applied case, is 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 uh, informative. Uh, another feature which has been being introduced fairly slowly and which comes from the 70s um, is uh, I referred to the paper by Hendry and co-authors in 1978, which was that a serial uh, correlation is informative and not a nuisance. So that we, should in, we should look at this. But the approach which was adapt, uh, adopted then by econometricians at the London School of Economics involved uh, adding what was known as Durbin terms. So what they were interested in doing was adding Durbin terms. In this case, there's only one, which is that uh, the Durbin term, let me try and find a different color, is that we add to our specification here 
Wx. And then we'll call it gamma as for the coefficients. So we're adding that in. We're saying, okay. And in time series, this, this can make a good deal of good deal of sense. Because maybe the problem is in the x variables, and because of the fact that the Wx's are emitted from the model, we're finding patterning in the residual. But if we include the Wx's in the model, then maybe the patterning in the residual will go away. So we'll do that. The models themselves are then harder to, rep harder to uh, um, interpret because we're now getting, in this case, because we've also got binary weights, which means we also get the, the spatial lag of the, of the intercept, which is essentially hard to, 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 to interpret. Uh, we've got a p-value on these coefficients, but actually what we're more interested in is the effect of the covariate, so that we, could, we, we, can, we can see what's happened to... Hausman is still OK. Uh, the, uh, the, it's fairly obvious that the spatial story and the residual is not there. The spatial story and the residual here was also not really there. One wouldn't say that there was a spatial story previously, but uh, and uh, the the uh, key point here is that we now need to look at the impacts or effects of the uh, of the uh, the covariates. In this case, there's one covariate. This would be very much like the standard setting where you um, increment the value of the covariate by one. Right? So if you increment the value of the covariate by one. You would expect, so you, you predict from the fitted model, and you've got a, a predicted value for the response. You increment the so one of the covariates by one, and predict again. And in a, an aspatial setting, and also in this setting, because there's no spatial process feeding into the impact, uh, what you'll see are the coefficient values, so that the impacts, the direct impact is the coefficient on uh, the uh, Freeman-Tukey transform non-white birth rate. The indirect impact is the counties surrounding the county of interest, and then the total impact as a sign change compared to the this one. So we've got a sign change. These are the standard errors, which are found in this case by linear combination, the z values, and in the initial model, uh, this variable was seen as being, uh, as being important. However, when we step back and say, okay, if we take account of the, of the neighboring counties, this variable is probably not important either. So that, that's a bit of a shame because we then get a sort of no story story, <laughs> is that, that we don't know a great deal about what is driving the, the freeman dukey transformed rates apart from the relative size of the of the of of the of of the of the um, uh, the relative size of the population size of the county or num count, birth counts. Uh, a speculation is that this model suffers from from n not using a mixed model approach because we're going straight for the freeman tukey transformed rate so that we've transformed in this case both the the uh, the um, both the um, uh, response and and the covariates whereas perhaps it would be better to treat the uh, the uh, the the setting as being one of a Poisson regression. So first fit using hierarchical uh, uh, GLM would be to f first fit an unstructured IID in, uh, 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 independent and identically distributed random effect to each of the each of the counties, 
this is this is uh, expressing the expectation. What would we expect if we didn't know anything else about the data uh, with regard to the count of of SIDS cases? And that would be the uh, raw rate. That's the sum of all of the SIDS cases in the data set divided by the sum of all of the births in the data set. So that, that would be what we would expect. It would be like the intercept. But we're expanding it out for each of the counties so that we're saying if we applied the rate over the whole state to each of the counties, this would be the count we would expect. And the count we observe might differ from this. That what we're saying here is we've got the offset as log E, the, uh, the fixed relationship, the fixed equation is, uh, is that we've got the SIDS counts, uh, we've got the freeman tukey transformed non-white births, birth rate, and non-white births, uh, we've not births, so the non-white birth rate with regard to all of the births, and the random is to express the, the uh, IID random effect. So we're now using a, a mixed model approach to, to this. We've also got case weights, the data, and we're saying that it's a Poisson model with a log link. And we can then fit this, and we can look at the, uh, at the, at the um, uh, IID random, random effect. Uh, the hierarchical uh, uh, GLM also lets us fit a SAR model. And in this case, we give it the, uh, the um, uh, sparse matrix uh, expressing the So the, the, all that we've done here is to expand the model a little, and uh, we can look at the, the, these, these random effect values. Um, we can plot them as well. I don't know how good you are visually remembering that pattern and the, uh, the one this this the the uh, as I should have used the same the same uh, color scale on on these but but we've got some areas which are quite low here and other areas which are quite high there's one quite high one here one quite high one there uh, so we're essentially reproducing the same uh, the same the same uh, features uh, that we would have found in however the IID and the uh, spatially structured random effects are actually quite simple, and it's not easy in 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 these this style of spatial modeling. The assumption is that all of the idiosyncratic effect of an individual observation is is encapsulated in the spatial bit. Uh, you referred to using a BYM model, uh, which is a bessag york mollier model, which tries to separate out the the IID and the spatially structured bit. And very often you find that, the, that they don't, that it pulls out the, the spatially structured much more strongly than the IID when it's offered the chance to do it. So the, this is an area where actually from the 1970s through to now, we're not really sure what's going on. There are a number of authors who've attempted to look at it without a great deal of success. Melanie Wall claims that the whole thing is madness and you should just only use geostatistical approaches. However, Markov random fields are there and Gaussian Markov random fields are extremely fruitful. It, however, how we should partition the variability as to whether it's idiosyncratic for the individual observation and should then get a random effect for the individual observation plus a sp spatially structured random effect or whether we should put all of the idiosyncratic in the spatially structured random effect is unclear. But this representation puts, puts everything which is a bit peculiar into the, into the spatially structured random effect in the same way that I said that Moran's eye detects lots of different kinds of misspecification. We're not really sure to what extent you should validly interpret the coefficient on the spatially structured random effect as being just spatial or whether it also mops up other oddities in the data generating process. We're, we're, not, we're not too sure about that. That is heretical. So that if you're, uh, if you're a true believer in spatial, spatial modeling, then probably that you shouldn't listen to that. Um, sorry. 
because I, I know that I don't, I know that not only that do I not know, but I know that the literature hasn't looked at these kinds of things. The disciplines do things their own ways, and they tend not to tend not to to interact across those. Uh, using uh, conditional uh, and Markov random field autoregressive approaches. So this is then using the alternative car specification. In this case, our weights are symmetric. It's not a problem. There was an in, some incoming message, but I don't think that it was the it was Slido, but I'll open Slido to be sure. Come on. No. Okay, so, so we're okay. Um, this is fitting a car model. Uh, error SAR LM doesn't fit car models. It only fits simultaneous autoregressive models. And simultaneous autoregressive models are typically used in ecology, uh, in the social sciences. Uh, car models are typically used in, uh, the, uh, in epidemiology, the BESAG-based uh, car models typically used in epidemiology, and there have been a number of attempts to also bring them into uh, into um, uh, other fields, but the other fields tend not to be sympathetic to them, or they find them difficult. The fact that they require uh, symmetry in the weights is seen as being being a problem. Uh, however, there are. Uh, plenty of situations in which uh, uh, you, you, you'll end up getting very similar results from them. Uh, so this is, this is, this is uh, the, the result, the, these are the results of the car model. Um, uh, if we look at the, at the coefficient on uh, the, um, the uh, covariate, or on the fit of the model as a whole. Um, and this would mean going back to, say, to, to, to this was the Durbin model, so we want the one before that. This is uh, 0.037. In the car setting, it is uh, 0.41. But if you look at the at the standard errors, they, they are different. But the difference is because uh, a different amount of the variable, the spatial variability, is being sucked up in 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 the residual. Uh, we can also rep attempt to represent the spatial patterning. So this would be the 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 differences between the uh, the uh, these are for uh, Gaussian maximum likelihood ran, uh, random effects. So the top one is the is the using the same palette, uh, or use, sorry using the same class intervals. Um, the um, the SAR seems to be there seems to be a bit more action going on there compared to the other. But the the tendencies for the car model and the SAR model uh, are, are fairly similar. Both of them are well fit. So the, whether the car is a better representation of the underlying spatial process or whether the SAR is a better representation of the underlying spatial process is nobody's really looked at this. Uh, from the beginning, um, so back in, in, um, in 1997, there's a series of papers on uh, fitting the... Or Handling, computing the Jacobian for large data by by um, Barry and Pace, and Kelly Pace, who who works work, continues to work with with Jim Lesage, so that then the 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 abbreviation CAR meant that they could have the the really uh, attractive paper uh, title of Fast Cars. So they had a Fast Car paper, which was showing how to how to 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 fit 
uh, car models to, to quite large data, then 3,000 observations was quite, uh, in, in 1990, the middle of the 1990s, this was, this was an important paper and also led to the introduction of uh, uh, sparse matrices for calculating, uh, or for, for, for optimizing the log likelihood functions of these models in the, in the, the S plus spatial stats module and, and elsewhere. Uh, the space stat program and subsequently in geoda an alternative method is used which is also doing um, uh, advanced math on the weights matrix so it's it's approaching the eigen problem by by dividing and conquering so it 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 gets to the same kinds of things as the eigen value you'd need for the odd method uh, but it does it uh, by uh, using sparse-ish matrix methods for, for, for finding out where, where you need to go. So fitting the HGLM car model is just like the SAR model and the forest plots. We're now showing the spatially structured uh, random effect from, from using HGLM. The HGLM package is maintained from uh, uh, the University of Dalarna in 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 Sweden, in uh, so it's the statistics department at Borlinge, and they have particularly close links to South Korea, which is where uh, GLM and HGLM uh, come from. So that it, it's a, it's actually an interesting package in in a number of other respects because it's providing you with things which otherwise would mean going Bayesian, but but you can do this through uh, hierarchical uh, GLMs. When I say GLM, does everybody have a feeling for what a GLM is? Or some, some do. A, a, an LM is a linear model, and a linear model will be uh, such that the response should be Gaussian. So it should it's not necessarily follow a normal curve, but it's at least it's a continuous variable. When you have a response which is uh, 0, 1, or is a count variable like Poisson regression, logistic regression, probit, all of these kinds of things, then you're in the setting of a generalized linear regression. Or it's a generalized linear model, GLM, and a generalized linear model then inserts a link <coughs> relationship between the right-hand side, which is linear, and the left-hand side, which is then generalized, so that it's generalized linear, but you use a link function to bind the, those two together, and it, in, it involves a small number of iterations to, 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 to arrive. Some of the same kinds of things uh, can be found in generalized additive models, but a generalized additive model uh, is expressing the right-hand side as the separate contributions of the uh, functions of the covariates, not necessarily as a, as a, as a matrix, as a model matrix. Um, so, so here we've got the 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 um, the car and the SAR uh, uh, spatially structured random effect using a Poisson uh, a, a Poisson approach. That was that was the model that we were fitting here. So we're saying, okay, we we'll go with car. We're in Poisson regression. The data account data. So these are probably we're probably getting quite close to where we need to be. I'm not showing you the summaries with the coefficient values of, of, of these models. You're free to, to run the code and, and look at the summaries and so on. What I'm trying to do is say that the progress which has been made in spatial regression over the, the more recent period has been to remove the very strong constraints to only handle continuous responses, which we've suffered under for a long time. So that for a long time, it was seen as being uh, it was it was unattainable. There was there was no way to handle data uh, which was count or binary in a sensible way. Then you started to see possibilities of using generalized uh, linear mixed models to do this. So that was one approach, but usually with a geostatistical or variogram relationship. It's a Gaussian random field modeling the, the spatial dependence. But now we're starting to see the Marco random fields uh, kicking in in, in in a generalized linear model setting. And HGLM is a, is a nice example of that. I'm 
uh, I'm not to blame for it, but I was asked to go twice to Bolling, so I went once to do a, uh, a talk, and another time they were setting up a winter school, which was really nice, as we were out skiing during the day and, and, and working before it got light and after it got dark. Uh, which was it was really nice, and and uh, so we were sort of talking and saying was was the, the, your use of the hierarchical linear model has been in uh, uh, you're also dealing with large data sets, but uh, but um, in uh, association with uh, with uh, stock breeding. So if you've got a stock breeding uh, uh, um, hereditary tree. So that you know which ox and which cow were the prototypes for the generation of lots of lots and lots of other uh, um, um, cattle. So you've got many many generations. You've got many uh, different sort of origin points of origin. But obviously, because the genetic traits of the uh, of the um, calves and then when they become sexually mature, their calves and so on, are related one to another, then you've got the same problem of relationship between the observations. You can't analyze the data set uh, without taking account of the fact that, that uh, a calf is related genetically to its father and mother. Um, so that, that, that relationship was there. And they'd been handling that. And they said, well, perhaps you could generalize it to handle spatial stuff. And so they'd had one paper in... In, in 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 the R journal, and then then four years later, another paper turns up in two thousand fifteen, nice paper uh, showing that yes, you can do it, and then they worked a little bit on this dense sparse relationship, and it 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 as you can see it 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 now provides a solution which is 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 pretty good for at least for 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 moderate moderate sized data sets. So HGLM gives us a a, a fairly good fit. We could also go, go to generalized linear models in the uh, MGCV package. Here, we're not modeling all of the observations. There is a way to trick it to do that, but it's not, it's not easy. And the way to get the results out of this are not so easy. But if you're using a generalized uh, additive model, you can say fit a spline in the covariate. This isn't a terribly helpful covariate. And here we're using the LM uh, variable that we created uh, a day ago, representing the 12 uh, groups of, of counties. Um, so the, the construction of the model is fairly similar to what we were seeing with the HGLM model. But here, we, here we've got the counts of SIDS. Here we've got a spline in the covariate. And here we've got a, a, um, a um, Markov random field uh, random effect in the, uh, in the groups of counties, the 12 groups of counties. Once again, we've got the offset of the log E. The family is Poisson with the log link, and we're waiting the, we're waiting the cases. So it's the, it's the same model uh, coming through once again. And uh, so if we plot the relationship between the, uh, the so this is this is the 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 um, non-white births, and this is the, the the spline fit to this. So this is this is plotting plotting what that very it's it, it probably there's too little data to, to 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 make a good job of it. The summary the summary does express what, what's going on. It's obviously because because we've only got twelve groups, then the caterpillar plot is so showing how the individual random effects kick in is is not terribly informative. But you can see that some of some of them, some of the groups are expressing something which is very different from uh, from from zero. Uh, probably I should have color coded the groups here so you could see which which, which ones they were in relation to the in relation to the map. And then this is this is the this is the block. So we're now moving towards multi-level, right? So this is the block effect. Of if if you're in this block, then you would generally expect the the uh, the, the the counts to be 
So just being, being a county in that block will bring down the rate. It's just if you're in that part of the map, the rate goes down. If, if you're in this part of the map, the rate goes up. So it just shifts the, the sort of depending on where 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 where, where you where, where you are. This is the data set for from the uh, uh, Waller uh, and Gotway book. Uh, it's a data set that uh, Lance Waller had worked on previously. So there are, there's a history to the data set. The data set was attempting to relate the uh, relate the uh, the um, uh, incidence of leukemia to nearness to a pollution point source uh, point, uh, point sources there were three uh, point sources which which were identified in these eight counties of upstate new york and uh, and um, the z variable again is a is a freeman tukey transformed uh, rate because they were working with uh, with uh, models which were at that stage obliged to be obliged to be linear, so create a neighbor uh, a neighbor object, and uh, the first were fit a, so the, the 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 basic model was that this is the the uh, uh, Freeman Tukey transformed rate of uh, leukemia by uh, by census tract. In eight counties, this is the exposure. This is distance to the nearest of the uh, of the uh, point source um, pollution point source uh, locations. Uh, this is the percentage of age over sixty five, and the percentage of uh, a percentage of home owners in in the census tract, which was also felt to to, to play into this. Fitting it using a car model with case weights. As what we find here is that probably there isn't a spatial story, but we get a reasonable fit uh, to, for, for the model I itself. Uh, these are the uh, so that exposure appears to be so, uh, th there is a story there. Uh, most of the most of the uh, uh, variability in the Freeman Tukey transformed leukemia incidence rate I is explained by age which would be what one would expect if it was anything other than highly significant it would be really odd uh, so that the the rate is increased where the proportion of older people in the census tract population is higher and that would be what one would expect uh, and the percentage of homeowners the higher the homeowners the lower the rate but it's it's sort of borderline significant so so that so that deprivation or a a, a, a proxy measure of uh, uh, socioeconomic status gives us little traction. Most of the traction is coming from the age of the population in the in in the in the census tract, and there is a, a clear signal that that uh, closeness to the to the um, closeness to the uh, pollution point source locations does matter. Having included the case weights, we we find that there isn't really a spatial story. So the lambda is is probably uh, not not really playing into in, in into this. So this is the data set used in in the Waller and Gotway book. So these are some of the some of the references. Uh, this is the, the the reference to fitting conditional and simultaneous autoregressive spatial models in HGLM, which gives a, a really low threshold. So the, this. If it works for your data set, this is the easiest way of fitting a GLM with a, with a, with a spatial error term. This is the, the spatial Hausmann test, and this is the uh, applied spatial statistics for public health data. And if you, if you go and look, look for, for, for that book, then, then do look at, at uh, the chapter on spatial regression in the first edition of our book. And, and it's the same in the, the second edition of our book, where their data set is is replicated, so that you can see exactly how they define the models, uh, and how you can uh, reconstruct the results coming out of it. In the vignette on the SIDS data set, uh, the same thing is done for the uh, for the um, SIDS uh, data. 
the the next bit which we intend to start uh, after after the break uh, will then go on to look at an, a number of steps including or the, there are there are two two big chunks but one is called bayesian uh, spatial econometrics and there i'll also be talking about uh, the the whole family of uh, uh, so the simultaneous autoregressive family as it has developed over time, uh, which is a little odd. So, so if, if we get that far, then, then I'll talk about the whole family. One of the reasons for mentioning this now before we, before we close in, in five minutes is that in addition to to this model, which was seen as being the 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 standard approach, and all of the you you can't do car models in in this is is that at the beginning of time or even before the beginning of time, time series existed. So this is a model which you could call the spatial error model. And when we added the Durbin component into it, adding the Y, the, the WXs, then we'd call it a spatial Durbin model. We've got the linear model itself. Sorry, that one's wrong. We need the, this is, the Durbin is blue. It's having fun playing with colors. So it's a family of two. But we could say in a time series setting, you would say that y at t depends on y at t minus 1, plus the covariates. And then you get a model which looks like this. And then optionally, um, that was a, a gamma. And then you get two models which are the SLM. and the SDM up oh, again. Play with the colors, SD. The spatial Durbin, spatial lag model, spatial Durbin model. And in quite a lot of the uh, social science literature, this is known as the spatial autoregressive model, but that's the same three letter acronym as the uh, simultaneous autoregressive model, which is contrasted with the con conditional autoregressive model. So you've got two different uh, expansions of SAR. And that's, that's not good, but, but that's, that's life. In this model, uh, you run into particular problems, which um, I've already hinted at. In, in the spatial Durbin error model, you need to look at the impacts of the covariates, but it's easy to do through linear, uh, through linear combination. The same would apply if you ignored the spatial terms, that you would then have a linear model. That's just an LM. And then there's a model which is termed the SL. X, which is the same as a linear Durbin model. So that's the a standard linear model or standard GLM, but including the WXs. Uh, work on the including the WXs in standard models is really only beginning. They were sort of 
talked about a little by Jim Lesage in 2014. Uh, probably by now, in taking a completely standard aspatial model and putting in the WXs, it did seem to be really uh, destroying the branch, as, as I've already talked about, sawing through the branch on which one is sitting. And this, this, this carries on in the same tradition. <laughs> so you can use regular model fitting functions, just include the WXs and you're, you're done. However, there may still be uh, spatial autocorrelation. There, there may still be signal in the in in the noise that you might wish to wish to extract. But this this model this model uh, which will put a, a, a green um, ring round, and we will flip the representation here from. We'll call it lambda. That that's tidier. The problem here is that the expansion of the model is uh, that um, so that if we say what uh, y minus rho w y, which is what we saw before for the for the other term, is equal to x. Uh, then we also see that y is going to be equal to okay and that means that in interpreting the betas we also need to look at the value of rho We can't just was what happens what happens to y if you increment one of the x's by unity is not beta. It's only beta if rho is zero. If rho is different from zero, then the spatial process plays into the relationship between between um, beta and and so we increase one of these by one. But the change in y resulting from that will not be the same as beta unless rho is zero. If rho is non-zero, then it may play in more, may play in less. Once you add in the wx's, you may find that the coefficient on, as we saw before, the coefficient on the x is positive, the coefficient on the wx is negative. They may be both positive, they may be both negative, or they may be different signs. And so you get the the the, the interpretation problem uh, for uh, for for the impacts. Okay, so it's the impacts hit us in two thousand uh, in connection with writing the their book Lesage and Pace uh, reached the view that there was an issue here. Uh, Collegian and co-authors had stumbled on the same thing in 2006. Uh, and I, as Jim Lesage commented that in one of my speculations from 2002, I was also quite close because what I, I asked in, in a paper in 2002, how do you make a prediction from a model like this or this? How do you make a prediction? And I'd, I'd got to that in order to make a prediction, you probably need this. But I wasn't sure. And once you'd got to thinking about predictions, but I hadn't thought any further, I hadn't realized that interpreting the betas became a problem. But I had realized that you needed this process to make the prediction. And so that there were some of us who were sort of thinking about things and, and so on. So it took from, from uh, 2000, one two to uh, 2009 uh, before it, it beca became serious and it became serious when uh, when Manfred Fischer declared war on people not doing impacts as he had a paper with Lesage and uh, Pace uh, which came out in 2008 and their book came out in 2009 where they spend the introductory chapters describing the problem 
uh, but Manfred Fischer went into any conference session at a regional science conference where somebody might have been using a model involving the spatially lagged uh, response and put up his hand more or less, more or less before they'd begun their presentation. <laughs> At which point everybody's attention was sort of drawn to this. Uh, he, he's a, he's a, he, he's a, uh, edited uh, a, a wide range of geographical and regional science journals over over a long period. And uh, at that stage, uh, st still now, I uh, recommend rejection for papers that fit things the old way. So that, that's try to interpret the betas when they should have been trying to interpret the impacts. Impact methods have been present in uh, my the, the packages I maintain since 2010. I spent uh, uh, 10 days with, with Jim Lesage in Toulouse, uh, then we're sitting sort of across a desk and talking about how to... In he, his feeling was that this was the, uh, the, uh, the showstopper, not for stopping... Uh, his show because he he does Bayesian model fitting, and he said, okay, so if we're doing Bayesian model fitting, we've got thousands of samples of the betas and the row, so we can do inference on the impacts at no extra cost, but you guys with maximum likelihood. How on earth are you going to manage this? You've got to. You've got. You, you're going to have to do uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling from your fitted model, and that's going to take just as long as fitting the model Bayesian. So Bayesian is. So I said, well, that was the way I thought of it first too. But actually, you can run a multivariate normal sample from the fitted model. So you just do Monte Carlo testing and not. Markov chain Monte Carlo. Markov chain Monte Carlo means that you, you do one step and then use that steps fitted bit to do the next sample so that each sample depends on the samples before in a Markov chain. But you don't need to do that. You can just do, just do a, a, a Monte Carlo random, multivariate random sample from the fitted model and you're done. So he was... He was he, he, he said, okay, yeah, yes, I can see that, that that follows. As I was so excited that we were going to be able to oblige applied econometricians to use Bayesian methods, despite the fact that they prefer not to. Some of these things are difficult for the alternative approach, uh, the, the, the final model, which, which we haven't got here, but which I'll add in, in with a different ring round. Is, uh, is a model uh, which combines these, these two. Rho W, Y plus X beta plus U, and then U is the same as, 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 as here. And this, this model is, is uh, by uh, Lesage and Pace, is termed the SAC. Uh, but it's also known as the uh, the Sarah model. Uh, these two classes of models can be fitted by uh, by line search because you're only searching for the single here or here spatial coefficients. So it, it's 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 simple. Whereas here you need to search across a surface of values of rho and values of lambda. And a, uh, there are a number of papers which, which I have published, um, so one from 2012 and other things, where, where I show that very often the, the, uh, the surface of the log likelihood function is, uh, are any of you really excited by optimization? I thought you probably would be, so I'll mention it just, just, just sort of as a special, special treat. As you've got the, you've got say rho here and lambda here, and the, uh, the, very often the optimum looked like this, with local optima at the two ends of a banana. Uh, this is, uh, this is, 
sort of zero here and zero here. And uh, linear optimizer, so nonlinear optimization, really doesn't like doing that because it, it's bouncing backwards and forwards. The op optimum levels here and here may be separated by a very small amount. And then it's saying, yeah, give me a break. <laughs> Why on earth do you, do you want me to try and find the optimum value when it, it might be here or it might be there uh, for the pair of, of, of coefficient values? Um, there is a further variant um, y equals uh, rho w plus x beta plus w x gamma plus u, uh, which is then either known as the Mansky model or you could call it an S. Uh, that was not very helpful. Was wrong as well. Uh, so that the C would be sort of combined or something, a spatial autoregressive auto combined model. Uh, this would be like a time series where you would talk about autoregressive, autoregressive. Um, One of the further difficulties which, which are associated with, with these models are that, uh, sorry, are that in parts of spatial econometrics, uh, it is believed that using Bayesian or maximum likelihood models, Bayesian or maximum likelihood approaches is, uh, is uh, um, inadequate. One argument has been advanced that the, if the response is not uh, truly Gaussian, it's not a normal distribution, then the qualities uh, that one would expect from maximum likelihood uh, estimation are not uh, necessarily sustained. So that from the late 1980s collegian and Prucha and others have developed a, a range of, uh, uh, of generalized uh, uh, method of moments estimators for the same spatial models. However, in the argumentation given in the paper published by Collegian and Prucha in 1998, they claim that maximum likelihood is in any case practically unusable with larger data sets because of the difficulty of uh, uh, solving the Eigen problem for a large uh, weights matrix. Uh, the Fast Cars paper was pu published in 1997, but in a different part of the spatial statistics literature. Had they seen the Fast Cars paper, I don't know whether where, where you're using Spas Koleski for uh, for solving the finding the log Jacobian values. So at least one of the major motivations for using methods of moments approaches uh, to fitting spatial models appears to me to have disappeared at the very beginning. But maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Maybe they had other reasons. Uh, in uh, 1998, uh, I tried to submit a paper with, with an economist to uh, an econometrics journal, and they said, we never do spatial. Spatial are a, a very odd interest. And why anybody would be worried with spatial? So it was desk rejected. Um, it was also desk rejected from the economic journal, but that was because one of the reviewers was Clive Granger. Uh, and he was also present when my co-author presented it at, at a meeting who said that you can't do spatial, spatial doesn't work. Uh, and he'd said the same to Ord in 1974, five. He was an advisor to Les Heppel. Um, and um, he has retracted subsequently. He said, maybe you can do spatial because uh, with, um, and I forget the name, I think Giacometti, I think was his, his co-author in 2004, published an article on, on forecasting with spatiotemporal data. Now, you could uh, aggregate all of the series and forecast the sum 
as a single time series. You could take the separate provinces and project them or forecast them separately and aggregate them. But it turned out that if you did a spatio-temporal predictions, so that you looked at the relationships between the provinces, you got a better forecast. So that he said, as I don't think I was wrong, but this shows that maybe there's something there. And subsequently, other uh, leading uh, econometricians, uh, such as uh, Hashem Pesaran and, and others, have worked with uh, with um, with spatial things because they see it as an extension of of uh, attention to clustering between observations. So you can you can you can uh, you can extend quite a lot of these these kinds of things in that direction. So that's given you a, a sort of roundup in terms of some of the the menagerie of, uh, of fitting functions. But when we uh, uh, meet again in in uh, in two hours. Uh, then we'll go multi-level first, and then only subsequently look at uh, look at some of the the ways in which uh, Bayesian and and um, and maximum likelihood play together, or can play together. The extensions beyond that are uh, so maximum maximum likelihood doesn't give us generalized linear models. Bayesian can give us much more flexibility, but Bayesian can also be fit by by Inler, which then in, in um, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and uh, Markov chain Monte, Monte Carlo, what you're interested in as the output from a Bayesian model is uh, the uh, joint posterior distribution. And if you have many, uh, many... Um, was you've got the coefficients in the model, and maybe you've got a spatial coefficient, but if you've got this spatially structured random effect, there will be one of those distributions for each of the, uh, of the spatial observation units that you have, so maybe quite a lot of them. This also affects, affects Inler. So that you're dealing in a, a highly dimensional uh, setting. Uh, some of which can be some of which can be compressed and 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 uh, and, and, and contracted. Um, getting to 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 non-continuous or non-Gaussian responses is uh, has has been has has been a problem. Um, I'll just mention for the for the sake of argument that that an alternative approach. Uh, which has been uh, has been used in a number of areas, particularly including including ecology, is to say that either in a continuous response or in a discrete response setting, it would be possible to so we've got we've got a model, but we add to the model the um, uh, the um, so then, then sometimes termed the Moran eigenvectors. So what you do is to uh, is to doubly cent doubly center the uh, the the W matrix. So we've got the W matrix, and then we doubly center it. That means it's dense, and we find its eigenvalues. So we've got n eigenvalues. The eigenvalues represent the spatial patterns which are feasible within that graph. And then you can uh, use a stepwise approach to say which of these do we need to add to the model. So if you think in terms of this model here, which of, which of the eigenvalues do we need to add to the model to uh, either optimize the fit of the model or uh, to uh, eliminate the residual spatial autocorrelation, because combinations of the of the of the eigenvectors will allow you to do that, and you can do that with a generalized linear model, just in the same way that you can do it with a uh, with with a, uh, a Gaussian response. So that the, the, sometimes it's termed it's termed uh, spatial filtering. Uh, and in ecology, it's, it's termed the Moran eigenvector. 
uh, and there there are uh, there are references through the the ADE habitat family of packages uh, to to using these. However, you're still stuck if your number of observations is large because solving the eigen the eigen problem for more than ten thousand observations it takes a long time and doing the uh, the brute force uh, selection of which eigenvectors to 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 include also takes a long 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 time but it it, it is a way of getting around problems uh, in if, if if one encounters those, those kinds of problems uh, okay so i'll turn off the the streaming